All right, so now let's talk about photosynthesis. During photosynthesis, light energy is converted to chemical energy stored in the binds of sugar, usually glucose. Plants, algae, and some protists, and a few bacteria like cyanobacteria, are capable of carrying out photosynthesis. The reactants for photosynthesis include carbon dioxide, which is taken in from the air, usually through the stomata, water, which is taken in from the ground, usually through the roots, and light energy, which is absorbed by the pigment proteins, which are usually located in the leaves. The overall products of photosynthesis include usually glucose, some type of organic storage molecule, and oxygen gas. The overall equation for photosynthesis, for photosynthesis can be written in either of the two ways illustrated below. This is the way you usually see it. So we've got our carbon dioxide, our water, uh, our light, those are our reactants. Our products are the sugar, glucose. Um, there's also some water given off and oxygen gas. Notice that these six waters though, simply cancel out six of those so oftentimes we'll see it written as 6CO2 plus 6H2O yields glucose plus 6O2s. We also might see it in this, this form. This is more of a reduced equation. So CO2 plus water plus light gives us oxygen gas plus this is sort of a building block of any basic carbohydrate, CH2. Oh. So photosynthesis happens in two main stages, the light dependent reactions, we call that phase one, and the Calvin cycle, also referred to as the Calvin Benson cycle, also referred to as the light independent reactions. So those light dependent reactions, stage one, they occur on the membranes of the thylakoids, which are little uh, sac like structures located in the chloroplast. These, this happens in the leaves of eukaryotes. In bacteria that can do photosynthesis, this happens on uh, folds of the cell membrane. During the light dependent reactions, the light energy is absorbed. Eventually that energy is uh, used to reduce an electron acceptor. Usually it's NADP plus to make NADPH. Um, some of that light energy is also used to power the creation of a proton gradient um, and chemiosmosis can create some ATP, another form of stored energy. Oxygen gas is released as a byproduct of the breakdown of water that happens during this stage. So the three products typically of the light dependent reactions are NADPH and ATP, both forms of stored energy and oxygen gas. Phase two, the Calvin cycle happens in the stroma, the outer liquidy part of the chloroplast. Um, it happens in the cytoplasm of bacteria, photosynthetic prokaryotes. During this phase, the energy from the NADPH and the ATP that were made during the light dependent reactions is used to reduce and phosphorylate carbon dioxide gas to create G3P. And ultimately that G3P is usually used to make glucose. Glucose is important because it's an energy storage molecule that can be readily stored and or transported to other parts of the, the plant other than just the leaf. ATP and NADPH are, are energy storage molecules, but they're very unstable. They're very hard to store. They're very hard to transmit, transfer. That's why making glucose is important for a plant. So let's talk for a second about photosystems. Photosystems are these complex arrangements of pigments. I want you to think of them like an array of solar panels. Most of the pigments are chlorophyll A molecules. There's some other pigments like carotenoids and xanthophylls, chlorophyll B, that we refer to sometimes as accessory pigments. But again, think of the photosystems like an array of solar panels. Their job is to capture solar energy and they're going to funnel it um, to a pair of molecules of chlorophyll A in this uh, thylakoid known as the reaction center. This pair of molecules is sometimes called the special pair. Once, the, once enough energy reaches this pair, it, it's not passed on to any other pigments. Instead, this energy causes the special pair to lose electrons. And these electrons pass to another molecule in the complex called the primary electron acceptor. 
and they begin their journey through the electron transport chain, the ETC. There's two types of photosystems usually involved in the light dependent reactions, photosystem two and photosystem one. Photosystem two actually comes first in the path of electron flow. It's named photosystem two because it was discovered before photosystem one. The two photosystems absorb um, different wavelengths of light. Um, the PS2 special pair absorbs best at about 680 nanometers while the special pair in PS1 absorbs best at 700. Note that both of those wavelengths are orange to reddish orange. Um, most chlorophylls actually absorb blue a little bit better, but here we're talking about the whole photosystem, not just the chlorophyll molecules. So the set of wavelengths absorbed by a pigment is called its absorption spectrum. So in this diagram below, we see the absorption spectrums for three important pigments found in plants and most photosynthesizers. Chlorophyll A is the very dark green one, and notice that it absorbs best at right around 410, 415 nanometers. That's very blue light. And then it also absorbs pretty well, right around 700, the reds part of the spectrum. Chlorophyll B in the lighter green also absorbs um, blue little lighter shade of blue. It too absorbs in the uh, orangish red region. Notice that both the chlorophylls essentially um, absorb nothing in this part of the spectrum, the, the greenish and yellow part of the spectrum. And then we've got the carotenoids, which are usually orange appearing pigments. Notice they absorb uh, some in the blue, a little bit in the green, and then very little from their own out. And because they reflect the yellows and the oranges, that's why they appear yellow or orange, or maybe even red. So let's talk about some details of the light dependent stage. This process occurs on the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast in the leaves. Light energy is absorbed, and it's used to produce those really important energy storage molecules ATP and NADPH. Oxygen is generated as a byproduct of the breakdown or the photolysis of water. The light dependent reactions occur in two different ways in most photosynthesizers, non-cyclic photophosphorylation and cyclic photophosphorylation. These two processes occur simultaneously across the thousands of photosystems that are located on each thylakoid membrane. Non-cyclic photophosphorylation um, sometimes it's also called non-cyclic electron flow. Um, during it, both photosystems absorb light energy. The absorbed light is, is funneled to the reaction center of each photosystem. Eventually, enough energy is absorbed that it causes the reaction centers to become oxidized, to lose a pair of electrons. And these electrons start to move across the ETC. The electrons from photosystem 2 move across an ETC to photosystem 1. The electrons from photosystem one travel through a cytochrome co complex and are eventually, um, they're eventually used to reduce NADP plus to make NADPH, energy storage molecule. As the electrons move across the ETC, their energy is also used to power the active transport of hydrogen ions, H pluses, protons, from the stroma out into the thylakoid into the thylakoid, I should say. So this starts to build up a hydrogen ion gradient. So there's more, the, the concentration of H pluses is higher inside the thylakoid than it is outside. Well, those hydrogen ions can't just leave the thylakoid because it has a phospholipid uh, membrane and they're charged. But there's one way out and that's through the ATP synthase enzyme. So these things will shoot out through that ATP synthase enzyme it's able to use the energy from those moving protons to phosphorylate ADP to make ATP. That process of using the energy from the moving H pluses to make ATP is called chemiosmosis. And it is very important in both photosynthesis and cell respiration. But it's a way to create ATP uh, using energy from a proton gradient. 
So the, the, the process of making oxygen happens because photosystem two lost electrons. It needs to get those electrons back from somewhere. And it does that by essentially ripping apart water molecules, taking some electrons from them, leaving behind oxygen and hydrogen ions. Those oxygen atoms combine to make O2, which is the oxygen gas we all, all breathe. Now it's important to note that plants need O2 as well. O2 is not just a waste product. Plants do cell respiration, aerobic cell respiration, almost identical to the way that we as animals do it. They just make more oxygen than they use. But plants do need oxygen gas. That's important, an important point. The process of photolysis, the splitting of water, is the source of all of oxygen's gas. Of all of Earth's oxygen gas, I should say. But again, it's important to note that plants do use some oxygen gas to do aerobic cell respiration. Here we see non-cyclic photophosphorylation. So light is absorbed by both photosystem two and photosystem one. That absorbed light causes photosystem two to lose some electrons. Those move through uh, the ETC or the cytochrome complex. They ultimately reduce photosystem one. Photosystem one also lost a pair of electrons. They move through an ETC. They're used to reduce NADP plus to make NADPH, our first product, we'll call that P. As these electrons move across the ETCs, their energy is used to pump hydrogen ions from that outer part, the stroma, into the thylakoid. So H pluses are being pumped in. They build up a gradient. Think of this like stretching a rubber band more and more and more and more. This buildup of a gradient is a way to store energy. Eventually, those hydrogens will escape through, NA, through, the, through the ATP synthase enzyme, through a channel in it, essentially by a process of facilitated diffusion. And that enzyme is able to harness the energy of those moving H pluses to combine ADP and P to make ATP, our second product. And then finally, um, to replace the electrons that it lost, photosystem two splits water takes electrons from that water, leaves behind hydrogen ions and oxygen. The oxygens ultimately make the molecule O2. And that's the source of all the oxygen, oxygen gas, I should say, on Earth. Cyclic photophosphorylation occurs typically at the same time as non-cyclic. It only involves photosystem one. And the only product of this process is ATP. It doesn't make any oxygen gas. It doesn't make any uh, NADPH. Here's a diagram of how it works. So since it only involves photosystem one, photosystem one absorbs light energy. It loses that pair of electrons. The pair of electrons move through an ETC where their energy um, is used to, to pump hydrogen ions uh, into the thylakoid and build up that gradient. Those H pluses escape through ATP synthase and they carry out chemiosmosis and make ATP. But notice the electrons circle back around and come back to photosystem one. So the electrons that left photosystem one come back to it. So there's no need to split apart water and there's no extra electrons to, to reduce NADP plus to make ATP or to make NADPH. So the only product of cyclic photophosphorylation is ATP. Both plants are carrying out both of these processes at the same time um, to make their energy storage molecules. So now let's talk about the Calvin cycle. So its job is to take um, the energy storage molecules from NADPH, from, from the light dependent reactions, so the energy storage molecules of NADPH and ATP, and convert them into a more stable, more storable, more transparent, portable molecule, which ends up being glucose. Pretty much all photosynthesis occurs in the leaf. The other parts of the plant have to have energy and the plant has to be able to transport that energy to those parts from the leaf to the roots or to the stem. 
NADPH and ATP are too reactive to store and transport, so the Calvin cycle makes glucose and other sugars, which can be transported to the roots and to the leaves. The Calvin cycle happens in the stroma of the chloroplast in eukaryotes. It happens in the cytoplasm of photosynthetic bacteria. So it happens in three main stages. First stage is carbon fixation. And let's just, let's just look at this from a diagram. So here's our diagram of the Calvin cycle. Carbon fixation, and we're gonna look at this as what happens to three CO2 molecules at a time. So three CO2s are grabbed onto by an enzyme called Rubisco, and they're attached to a five carbon molecule called RUBP, Robulose bisphosphate. That makes an unstable six carbon molecule, which very quickly splits into a three carbon molecule called phosphoglycerate. We're gonna to refer to that as PGA. Now notice, there were three of these RUBPs, three molecules of CO2. Each RUBP was connected to one CO2. So that made three six carbon molecules. Those were very unstable and all three of them split into two three carbon molecules each. So we ended up with six three carbon PGA molecules. I want you to think of a PGA molecule as sort of half of a glucose, but without a lot of the energy. So the next step is called reduction. So during reduction, the energy from the ATP and the NADPH are added to the PGA. Here we see the ATP being used to phosphorylate the PGA. Add energy, add phosphate groups to it. Here we see the NADPH being used to reduce the PGA, add electrons and energy to it. Ultimately, we end up with a th some three, mo three carbon molecules called glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate or G3P. Those molecules, think of those as half of a glucose with the energy. Those are the molecules that are combined, two of those are combined essentially to make a glucose or other organic sugars that a plant might need. Now notice for the every turn of the Calvin cycle, six of those are made, but the plant only takes out one to make sugar. It uses the other five to carry out step three, which is the regeneration of the carbon dioxide receptor, which in this case is ribulose bisphosphate. So the plant has to constantly remake this RUBP so that the cycle can continue. This is not a very efficient process, but it's what plants evolve. It's the way they make sugar. So I wanna to stress to you, the purpose of the Calvin cycle is to take energy from the energy storage molecules made in part one of photosynthesis, convert it to, more, to a more storable, stable, transportable form, and that's glucose. All right, that's it for photosynthesis.